Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, Please stick around, and if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener-supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. So Marcello, it is pronounced Marcello, right? Yeah, Marcello. Marcello. I, I always tell people it's Marcello, not Marcello, and then they always call me Mar- Marcello after a while. <laughs> Marcello. Yeah, Marcello, um, thanks for, for joining us. I'm really excited to have a conversation with you. So before we get started, I'd love you to just introduce the audience to kind of your background with movement and the roles you've played for the parkour community, the movement community in Italy and in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so like uh, I have been um, um, practicing parkour for a long time. Um, I've been practicing parkour since yeah, 2007, more or less, 2006, 2007, uh, here in Italy. And uh, since then, I've been traveling and going uh, all over to meet at first like uh, the founders of parkour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, you know, all the different communities. So from uh, I've been um, going very often to, I went very often to Parkour Generations in London. Uh, I did my ADAP qualification there. And then, um, uh, yeah, I went to to Denmark. I spent a lot of time in there with the guys from Street Movement. I went to Parkour One uh, in Germany. And, you know, I kept going to all all the communities to meet everyone that is actually trying to make an impact uh, in this world at the moment. Mm, and uh, yeah, then also here in Italy, we, we uh, with Parkour Wave, my association, we took uh, the, the ADAPT qualification and now we are delivering it. And uh, yeah, we are trying to make an impact in the same way as others are, are doing out there. Um, yeah, and on top of it, uh, I've been uh, studying with uh, Ido Portal and uh, developing in general the, this, this approach to movement from a more generalistic perspective. And uh, yeah, also trying to spread it around uh, a bit locally, but mainly, um, yeah, yeah, like a bit locally. And in the future, I'm, I'm planning to, to do it more, to do it uh, a bit more solidly because at the moment I'm very busy also because I'm, I'm um, uh, finishing my master's okay. in strength and conditioning in London. So yeah, a lot of, of uh, balls to juggle around. And <laughs> yeah. So you're living in uh, Milan, is that the case or uh, yeah no now i'm living in padova in italy okay uh and um yeah but basically the the course is online okay so i'm going there like uh, sometimes per per year uh, okay. and now i'm finishing my my thesis and <laughs> very, cool. <laughs> very cool so very busy um excellent yeah. so uh, i'd love to dig into kind of parkour and movement culture and in your specific approach to pedagogy that's particularly what i'm interested in is um having kind of followed some of your uh your social media you seem to have a very particular voice around parkour training method and and so i'm, I'm interested in digging into that before we get there i'd like to ask you a couple uh more specific questions about what does your practice look like now and kind of what motivates your practice so let's start with what your practice looks like like what is a a week of Marcello's practice look like right now. <laughs> yeah, of course. So um, I have uh, different boxes um, where I can allocate my time so I can make uh, my practice very efficient. Mm, so at first I wake up and, and certainly I spend a lot of time um, with some uh, internal practice work. So some meditation and some something that is uh, yeah more around that topic. Uh, then I go out and I do a bit of research um, I have different uh, fields that I, that, I, that I want to dig into um, in this period. So now I'm very much interested into developing this relationship with uh, fear via height exposure, for example. Okay. Uh, so I'm working a lot on that field. But also, so uh, of course, attacking it from different angles. 
So going into climbing, for example, but also going into balancing, going into you know developing different attributes at height, uh, different typologies of breathings, uh, techniques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this is just one of the fields in which I'm doing research at the moment. It can be also be you know like flow um, on bars and some others. Um, but yeah, we, we'll get there afterwards. Um, and then um, yeah, I have my strength training which I, anyway I am experimenting with. Um, uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm studying a lot of uh, things in the field, so I'm also applying it on, on myself. Um, and, you know, and I have some other uh, small projects ongoing. Um, of course, certainly another thing that I do, um, I, I always make sure to take at least one or two days per week to go out uh, to do some form of exploration which might mean going out in the city or going out in the nature and to live some authentic experiences, you know, just going out there and trying to uh, grasp whatever I can grasp from the surrounding. It can be some form of urban exploration practice or infiltration practices or, or even just uh, going out, um, you know, like in the mountains and, you know, lighting a fire or, you know, like uh, carving some wood, doing something that is um, that allows allows me to reconnect a bit with nature, which is something that you know, like we have kind of lost, but it's it's in us. Whenever you go back, you realize <laughs> it's in us. I know you you are also a big believer in this. Yeah, for sure, nature is uh, is what I'm all about. Um, so, I, like, how many hours a week would you generally spend on your practice? How many hours per week? Certainly, um, I would say, well, for sure, it's more or less four to five hours per day. It's basically, yeah, it's like a, lo a lot of time, mm, but not all the time. It's it's training, you know, like physically training and demolishing my body, of course, sure. because uh, that, that is also not, not sustainable on a very, very long term. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's too much. Um, so it can be... Uh, uh, dedicating this time to some form of research for myself or for my students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in general, this is what I do. Like this is the way I like to live my life. So that means, like, I wake up and I and I have a lot of things to do. This is my work, at the end of my my job, and also my life. I, I'm not trying, you know. Like recently, I've heard some people say in the socials and here and there saying, like, uh, okay, how can we minimize the time we spend training? in order to get the, the best outcomes and the more benefits out, out of what we do. I mean, like, of course you can try to minimize and you can try to, uh, to spend the least time possible training to, you know, if you're practicing uh, deliberately, I'm sure you can practice half an hour a day and you're going to get something out of it. But the idea is what, what are you going to do with the rest of the time? <laughs> you know, like for me, it's like, I want to actually be there uh, practicing because it's, it's a great thing to do. Yeah. So, yeah, it changes a little bit when you're uh, when you're married with children. Um, time is <laughs> very precious, and it's very you have to become very very effective. That's at your use. Of I it. can't imagine. But, uh, That's why I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's also I mean there's this side of it of like I I hear where you're coming from because I feel like people are so interested in shortcuts. They're so interested mm -hmm. in hacking their way. You know, like every time yeah. someone talks about you know biohacking or you know self-hacking it's a sort of like what about self-cultivation right uh -huh. and exactly me, exactly if, it's not so much that you don't want efficient practices that get you from one point to another but that sometimes the the urge to find the shortcut takes you away from the experience which is actually the the point of the thing in the long run anyways yeah certainly yeah, like th those things uh, should be practiced, and th those um, and the roads should be walked. Like if you if you spend your your time reading uh, posts, but even like uh, well, for the for the more shallow people, but also reading books and reading, you know, like reading about certain universes, mm, I think it's okay, it's great. But at the same time, you need to uh, let it filter inside you by um, experiencing it. On, on, on your skin, what it means. Um, like, you know, uh, if, if you ask me, what, what does it, um, um, what is it about, like, you know, just uh, walking, walking on top of a, of a high wall with your heart racing and, you know, like practicing up there or, you know, doing a free solo. 
I can tell you what it feels like, but it will never filter in because uh, we, we are not um, disconnected from our emotions. This is one of the ways we remember things. Uh, so so uh, I want to be able to live li a life that I can remember without necessarily, you know, like writing down every day and whatever, because everything is very meaningful in what I'm doing. So I just, uh, I just live a full life in this way. And I, and I recommend everyone, everyone that is listening, just don't just read or just w uh, watch videos or whatever. Just spend your time out there as much as you can uh, doing things that are extremely valuable for you. Uh, you were saying like when, you, when you're married or you, you, know, like you're, you have kids and whatever. Still, I would say when you're with kids, <laughs> you're spending a very meaningful time. So it's, not, uh, it's some form of a, of a practice. What I don't like, like when I see people, you know, like scrolling down uh, the sources forever, like three, four hours, and then they realize at the end of the day, oh, I wasted the day, and the day after it's the same. You know, like what yeah. are you doing? Yeah, you know, just stop for a second, uh, go out there, uh, practice, and then you come back, and suddenly you have a better relationship also with time, uh, which is something that we have, and it's extremely limited. Yeah, yeah most precious resources are our time and our attention. I, uh, I actually, I came across, uh, I was, um, with my friend Daniel Eisenman at this retreat called international tribe design that he, he runs. And he, he had a great analogy for this. He talked about the menu versus the meal, right? Okay. Like, like reading or watching a video about how to do a parkour movement. Uh -huh. That's like the menu doing the thing is the meal. And there's so mm -hmm. many menus, there's so much information out there that we get addicted to reading menus and we forget to actually sit down and enjoy the meal. 100%. Uh, I can connect to this uh, totally and I can read it. Actually, um, you know, like uh, in, the, in some old tales, uh, you have these masters looking at the, at the people you know, and saying, okay, this person did this in his life, this other person did that in his life. Like being able to uh, understand the person you have in front of you, like right away, it looks like, uh, you know, as if it was a magic thing. But actually, the more I, I'm out there, you know, the more I realize when I see somebody that is actually practicing and doing a lot of things and you know, li living life in the same way as I do, we just recognize it's the same as like two dogs, similar dogs come one close to the other and they say, okay, you are, uh, you are from uh, the same family as, uh, as I am, you know, like in, in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, at times I, I, I was, I had this thing, uh, walking around the road uh, and uh, recognizing a parkour practitioner, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, <laughs> parkour? <I> was, yeah. <laughs> like, How does this happen? And it's just mm -hmm. because it actually changes something inside you that is way more powerful and, and deep than what we would expect normally. Yeah, there's that, plus the feus and the uh, baggy pants and the top knot. <laughs> Not only that, but <laughs> yeah, certainly plays a big role. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Class. Yeah, I think about that stuff is kind of in this interesting space uh, where, we, where we're tuning into intuitive knowledge one of the things is interesting. I, I'm a very analytical and rational person, but I think one of the cool things that comes out of movement practice is the realization of how limited rationality is. The realization yeah. of how limited our capacity to think about things is and how much more powerful we are actually when we develop feel an embodied sense of things. So when we're mm -hmm. looking at somebody and we say, ah, that guy, that guy probably does parkour. Our, our, our brain has modeled how a person moves who does parkour, how a person holds themselves yeah. who does parkour. We've modeled, there's all this, there's this tremendous amount of information that's available to us in the way a person carries themselves, in the way a person walks, in the way the person, you know, the clothes that they choose. And we don't always know cognitively that we know that, but, mm -hmm. but we can feel it. And when we tune yeah. into that and when we, when we sort of, Every time that we go up and say, hey, man, you look like you do parkour. Do you do parkour? And they say, oh, yeah, I do. How'd you know? Mm -hmm. that, that sort of helps you cultivate that intuitive sense of, of, uh, of what the world is like. You know, it's, you're, you're helping to, to map your, your perception to reality more closely. Mm -hmm. 
Certainly, yeah. You know, like I have, my old blog was called uh, Animal Scholar <laughs> for a reason. Because I, I was realizing since I was very, very young that I always had this animalistic soul inside of me. You know, I, I've always uh, loved this thing that actually if you leave the, the influ intuition flow, it, it is telling you already a lot of things because you can just control everything right, uh, rationally. Uh, yeah, at the same time, of course, if this takes over, and it's, it's the main thing that drives your action. After a while, you're going to end up homeless, <laughs> very happy homeless, probably for a, for a certain amount of time. But then, you know, uh, you need to inject also the logic into what you do. And that's why also I went into the academic education, for example. But it's whenever I am with the, with the academics, I'm like, guys, get out of there. It's mm -hmm. not just get out of the lab, but it's not just about the lab. It's about the, the approach, of course. Get out of the lab not in the sense of like not in the physical sense get up of the light um, get out from from uh, this uh, mindset and the idea is like for example okay uh, you know you do three sets of eight reps for this reason for that reason you know but then what happens if you do a thousand reps for example or, or you just uh, not count them anymore and uh, you you approach the practice from a qualitative perspective and etc etc what happens there are a lot of discoveries out there uh, that um, are there to be to be taken, to be to be found, and uh, I've, I've always found a lot of different things out of this approach, which is like it's a, it's a bottom-up approach, and this is the one that, that I uh, cult cultivate more uh, dearly. So I go out, I try an experiment, and then I see what comes up. If it's something interesting, then I can attack it from uh, from the top-down approach. No, so okay. So maybe it was like this. I can I can come back home, place all my papers on the on the walls, you know, connect them uh, like in a crime scene, and then I I can see if I can uh, extrapolate out of what I've been doing something that is actually valuable. But at first it was always, you know, like we do it. I remember this time I was with uh, Jan mm -hmm. uh, in in uh, Every. Uh, and we were for, we, for the yeah. for the audience. Jan Jan Hanato I, is uh, one of the founders of parkour, one of the Yamakazi. So go ahead. Yeah, I was there with my with my uh, brother and some friends, and uh, we were on top of this high wall, and uh, there was a gap between two walls. And on the other side of the of the wall, there was a, a big bush, uh, like full of you know like horrible plants and. I was like, okay, now we, it was the whole day training, destroyed. Okay, you go, run, side flip the gap, and then you, you go into the bush. I was like, <laughs> what is this guy saying? It's like, incredible. And then he was like, okay, you go first. I was like, what? Okay, so run, 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 run. Goes for the, for the side, I go for the side flip, boom, into, the, into this plant. And what happens? I survive. And from that day, I remember like the pattern of the, of the side flip is in my, in my body. You can't take it away anymore because of that, that, specific, uh, that specific moment. Uh, and, you know, like I got something incredible out of that. And, uh, you know, like always doing super precise risk assessment and this and that. We'll, never, we'll have never um, unlocked it for me in, in the same way. Also, the typology of experience was incredible. The, the moment extremely powerful. There was something inside all of us that, that you know, like it created somewhat of a bound that was uh, from another world, really. So, you know, like if, if I had to use my rationality, it was like I would have said, of course, yeah, no way, no way I'm going to do this. It's like jumping into uh, <laughs> from one wall to another with the, with the horrible plant in between. I would never, would have never done this. And, you know, Mm, yeah, it just adds something. It adds something, so I can connect with what you're saying, totally, hundred percent. Yeah, so you're in an interesting place because you're you're embedded in a practitioner community, right? And like a guy like Jan, as far as I know, he's not um, he's not relying probably on on a rational system and a logical uh, <laughs> um, a system of of pedagogy, right? He's not saying, okay, well. Yeah. Because X, Y, and Z, I know you're ready to do this, this flip, you know, exactly. probably an in the moment calculation that's uh, almost completely gut based. 
And then you're also embedded in the academic community where you're around a lot of people who think a lot about physical practice, but probably engage in it very little. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Was, well, at least not, not uh, you were saying one more thing. Um, I was just asking if I was correct that, that a lot of your academic peers are, are relatively um, sedentary, actually. Yeah, like more than sedentary. Every time I, I look at these people, I look at um, somebody that is extremely, extremely, um, I don't know, uh, interwoven into uh, a practice that is just made out of, you know, like some regular sport and some training and, and a training career and, you know, like something that is uh, finite and something that, you know, starts today and finishes tomorrow, something that is never questioning, something that is uh, it's never fresh and new and, uh, you know, like as if they couldn't take it from the tail and, and move it around, you know, the way they want it. It's just something that is, you know, what do you do? I do weightlifting and, and I, I, I play rugby until I can. And then, you know, I, I probably weightlift just a bit more, you know. And then I'll experiment with my athletes because, of course, like words are there also to create these categories. You know? Like you are an athlete, I am a coach and, and you know, like uh, I have um, nobody, nobody talks about um, personal practices. Nobody talks about having students in some from from a wider perspective nobody talks about these things it's, it's often something that you know ends uh, when the person goes out of the gym and begins when the person get, comes in and you know and also you know like the the things that they are that, that they are doing uh, are very ritualistic at times you know like why would you engage in weightlifting i don't know, like why didn't you engage in a brachiation practice <laughs> I don't, like literally when i asked to the to them it's like what is a brachiation? This is the, the, the thing that they, they, they answer. It's like, okay, so I show them the brachiation, but then they say, okay, but there is no system for me, no system of reference in many forms. So uh, how can I implement it with an athlete again? You know, like it's, if it doesn't fit the box, it's not there to be taken. And this is something that for me is like death. Uh, and before, before it starts, like whenever I sense a kind of challenge, Instead, like I just, I just jump in because I know it can grow like uh, my third arm from above, and I don't ask them why. Uh, like if if I ask you, do you want a third arm? Probably you would say, okay, yeah, why not? <laughs> Let's try what it means. You know, having a third. You wouldn't ask me why would you give me a third arm? You know, like it, because it, it opens possibilities, and in the same way, you know, I I always uh, do this because like. Open, open up channels, open up possibilities because like, uh, you never know what it can take you. And those guys, often they are just boxed. They're boxed, yeah. So yeah. Oh, where did I want to go with this? There was a question that I had earlier and then there was something that came up within that, which is about this. Oh, it was about, are you familiar with the work of uh, Ian McGilchrist? He has a book called The Master and His Emissary. Mm, yeah, I've heard of it. I, I never uh, went into it. Yeah, one of the central ideas is that the rational mind, which is the left hemisphere, tends to live in the left hemisphere, um, uh -huh. at least in right-handed people, and the, the intuitive mind tends to live in the right hemisphere. And the rational mind is sort of dominant in our culture, but it, it's very limited in its ability to sort of comprehend holistic problems. It tends to like to get set in these boxes. I can imagine myself in the, um, in the perspective of your, your strength and conditioning coach, right? Um, mm -hmm. Your strength conditioning friend, right? It's like, okay, well, brachiation, what is that? Mm -hmm. It may be a great practice, but what's it for, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, athletes come to me because they want to lose weight or they want to get strong and have, mm -hmm. you know, strong is measured by a squat, a deadlift, a, a bench press, or because they want to improve sports performance. And I, and I know if I go into the literature, I can say, hey, you know, if we, um, if we do this type of weightlifting, then we're going to see yeah. a, uh, a, a specific kind of general relationship between that and mm -hmm. vertical jump performance and, and sprint performance, which are relevant to sport. Whereas mm -hmm. there's no research on, there's no, uh, there's no trial. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know what you mean. Of course. And so this, this is, you know, this is a useful 
skepticism. Um, but the problem is that there's so little that's been measured that it closes an enormous amount of doors. And it, and, it, and it makes places, I would say it makes places where people can feel safe in what they think they know. <laughs> yeah. Instead of being able to step outside and, and then having to ask, you know, not, not the, not the journals, but having to ask their own experience, having to pay attention empirically to what's happening. And for me, parkour has been one of the most fascinating things to observe how it's grown because it's not, it's not, it's not a rational pedagogy that was developed. It's not, um, it's not trained in a consistent manner from one place to another. Uh, there's no coaches. There's no, I mean, there are coaches, but it's very few athletes are really interacting with coaches relatively. And those coaches are not, you know, they're not that many systems to support them. It's, it's really a minimal structure. It's a very free and organic thing that's developed. And yet what we're seeing now is that the top athletes in the parkour community from my perspective are now reaching levels of general capability that, um, that rival or surpass anything we see in the more traditional sports community. Um, yeah, certainly. So I'm curious, just from your perspective, how would you advocate we work on this balance between uh, the the benefit that this rational perspective can bring that you're learning mm -hmm. through the strength and conditioning community and that perspective of say yawn, right? The people who come up mm -hmm. and say, I don't give a shit about the theory. I'm just going to smash myself every day and I'm going to learn to feel when that feels right. And I'm mm -hmm. yeah, no, to push other people. Is a, it's a great question. This is uh, a question I also had for my, uh, for my teachers. In, uh, in the strength and con uh, conditioning world. Um, and basically, my idea is, okay, so first of all, being an evidence-based practitioner um, doesn't mean um, you, you can't look at experience as well uh, in order to build your practice. Like, your decisions shouldn't come from, um, you know, just uh, going through the literature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, yeah, like um, practice-based evidence is also a huge thing. Like all good evidence-based practitioners do the opposite as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and like the, the problem with a lot of academic uh, people, et cetera, et cetera, is that uh, they use the evidence-based practice as a, as a limitation in a way. I see it as, as the third arm, you know, like something that is uh, in addition to what you do. You know, like uh, I can also check the list of where it is going uh, like for example, in in um, and and sometimes it's extremely useful because like when when you know that you need to do a bit of prehab in this or that area, um, you can use like the the fresher knowledge coming out from the from a I don't know a systematic review uh, that is telling you okay you're gonna do that exercise for that amount of sets and it's probably you know going to make your shoulder stronger and you know like you you. Uh, cross it with the rest of the information you have and you use it in order to you know like uh, uh, bulletproof your practice in a way so uh, from the way I see it it's always like finding this balance between the evidence-based practice and the practice-based evidence always going uh, from you know like uh, the people that are actually uh, making an impact at the moment uh, in, in different communities, in, in different forms, you know, like, so for example, um, I went to, to my, um, to my teachers in London and I learned a lot of stuff in the, in, uh, in the last things in the, um, in the strength and conditioning world, in the, in the last researches. Uh, I learned how to do research and the same way I went to the, to the people that made an impact right now, like Jan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I went to all of the all of the guys in order to make up my mind, mm. and from there I just uh, cross all the information that I have, and then I make a, de a decision. I don't try to look for the decision inside the information that I get, and this is also a huge bias that people have. You know, like when they read study or they find a new training method or you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, they just say, okay, this is what I'm gonna do, and and this is like the uh, the decision that I'm going to take for the rest of my life. Yeah. Mm, is instead, like, okay, you already, you still have 
the, re the rest of the experiences that, that you had, it's not like you need to throw them away. But you're going to add all the different pieces and then make a decision. Of course, having said so, I'm not saying that I'm doing things right. Uh, I'm, saying it, uh, I'm saying that I'm doing the things um, the best as I can at the moment. You know, like I'm sure if I look at myself in five years from now, I will slap myself in the face. Uh, Palazzo, what were, you doing? what were you thinking in that period of time? But it's normal, you know, like uh, this trial and error needs to go on and on. Yeah, so yeah absolutely. This is my take. I like, uh, I like uh, for some reason, it brings up Nassim Taleb for me and a lot of his ideas around how uncertain mm -hmm. reality is, how probabilistic it is, and how easy it is for us to sort of uh, um, get lost in the noise and how kind of the answer mm -hmm. to that is just exposing yourself to mm -hmm. small errors all the time and just tinkering. Yeah. Like you'll never come up with a theory that's perfect that allows you to solve all the problems. Yeah. So you just have to be in the game, have your skin in the game and keep, keep exposing yourself. Exactly, yeah. And I've heard this from uh, a lot of people uh, recently, you know, like I was reading the, the 12 rules of life from Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Uh, everybody went through them, of course, it's not, not mm -hmm. to quote it again. But you know, like he's saying this, and him, like a million other people are realizing this thing is the truth from our, for our everyday life. Okay. Yeah, so it's interesting. I actually think that Taleb and Peterson are, they're, they're very similar in their essential idea, which is that we live with uncertainty um, we, and mm -hmm. in order to live a good life, we have to voluntarily take on uncertainty, put ourselves at the limit of what we can adapt to and, and continually seek out and continually tinker with our life and move forward. And, mm -hmm. you know, Taleb talks about being anti-fragile, right? anti yeah, yeah, yeah. comes from essentially voluntary exposure to stressors. And he talks mm -hmm. about putting your skin in the game, right? And, uh, you know, yeah. Peterson talks about living out the heroic archetype and confronting your dragons, but essentially it's the same basic message, right? Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that I think that, that, that that's essentially the ethic that the parkour community has, has embodied, the movement community has embodied, but especially I would say the parkour community, but the movement community in a broader sense. And that's where I'm really interested right now. Um, mm -hmm. One of my big areas of interest, there's lots of them, but one of my big areas of interest is this, um, articulating the why of our practice. Because I, I remember in the early days of parkour, people talked a lot about the parkour philosophy. But mm -hmm. uh, nobody could really tell you what it was. Mm -hmm. So I started, so I, you know, if, you, if you're at, in that rational level of thinking and someone says, oh man, this practice that we have, it's, it's all about a philosophy. And then they try mm -hmm. to describe the philosophy to you and it's totally incoherent. <laughs> yeah, classic. This is, philosophy. This is bullshit, right? But mm -hmm. If you're looking at it at the intuitive level, I think what you see is if you, if you spend time with especially old school practitioners all over, they do share some central ethics. They do share something. They may not be able to describe what the game that they're playing is to you, but they're playing yeah. the same game. Yep. And when I, when I encountered Peterson, um, it, it was sort of like he's describing the game we're playing. He's describing what we're doing. And then it was interesting because I'd read Taleb and I liked Taleb. Uh, but I, but I'd kind of drifted away from some of his thoughts. And then when I read Peterson, it was like, oh, it's independent confirmation of the same basic ideas. So mm -hmm. I, this is one of the questions I wanted to ask for you, because I know that you kind of dived into the same idea of like considering your practice more, not just from the how of what we're doing or what we're doing, but really the why. So I'm curious how you've articulated your movement philosophy and, and how it kind of plays into some of these other ideas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, um, the, the idea is, the thing that I was telling you before uh, in regard to the, to the third arm is not, was not a, a, a casual thing for me to say because uh, whenever I go out there and I look at space uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I look at the, all the poss possible interactions with it, uh, I sense like there is uh, some potential that is there to be taken in a way. Uh, and you know, like, and this is actually the, the foundation of, of, of yeah, the main reasons why I do things. So it's like, I, I go out there, I sense that there are possibilities, and I just take them. 
I take them one day after the, the other and uh, I keep exploring uh, and I keep seeing what, what it can be done well, uh, out there with, with these things. Mm, and yeah, I mean, like, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible because the more you can keep it minimalistic in a way also of uh, understanding these things, um, you know, like the better it works for you and for others. So first of all, why would you do things just because it's possible, and, and this is a, a huge thing for me, uh, it was a, a big realization that I had. Um, certainly, um, besides from this is, uh, whenever I confront myself with all these, th all these challenges that come up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, on the other side of the tunnel, I've, of the tunnel, I've always found something that was extremely uh, powerful and uh, you know, like it was making me grow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you take challenges away from me, I realize from the day after I am dead. I have nothing else. You know, like so. It's also a, a powerful instrument for growth. And if I, um, you know, like if, if I try to uh, move away from this idea of you know, like practicing and going out there and uh, exploring the city and you know, developing uh, myself, I, I'm done. You know, like it's also um, for me. It came from uh, from the other way around. Rather than uh, why would you engage at first? It's like what happens if I don't? <laughs> it's uh, it's a total and absolute mess. Uh, I I feel like I am in the open ocean, like a uh, how do you call it? like a, a cockroach, like yeah. <laughs> the beef. You know, like upside down, uh, yeah, fluctuating yeah. in. The, uh, but, yeah, yeah, but, but like fluctuating in the in the ocean, uh, upside down, and I have no references anymore. And so for me, like this thing was uh, uh, was a huge realization, and uh, and uh, and I'm trying to push people towards uh, their physical to, towards developing their physical practice because uh, it's it's a, a huge mess if you don't. Um, yeah, so this is the 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 basic fund foundation of what I do. Uh, like the reasons why I I go out there and I start practicing and I keep practicing forever and ever and ever. Um, yeah. So does it yeah. does I, it connect I, with I you? Challenge you to, uh, I challenge you to try to, to to refine it more. I think all the ideas are in there, but but like one of the ideas that yeah. I don't think is when people say just because, right? Mm -hmm. just because, right? I do it because to me that that you you can go deeper than that. I, um, that was something mm -hmm. that, said that really bothered me actually. He said, uh, he, um, he shared a video of Johnny Dawes, who I really admire. Johnny Dawes is mm -hmm. uh, kind of a crazy rock climber guy. And he's just, uh, he's gotten really into climbing rocks without using his hands. Mm -hmm. And someone asked him why. And he's like, well, it's kind of a stupid thing to do. I don't know why I do it. I just do it. <laughs> uh -huh. He posted that and he said, um, uh, he said, you know, this guy gets it, you know, this guy gets it. It's not about anything. I just do things and, and I like the way it, it makes me feel. So I keep doing them. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that's a sufficient answer. I don't think that that, I think that there's a deeper layer that you can go to, right? There's a reason that taking on challenges makes you feel good. And there's a reason that you look at the idea of a, pro, of a, of a life without a practice and say, mm -hmm. that feels like chaos. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it slots right into that sort of Petersonian perspective, right? The world yeah. is undifferentiated chaos. You as the individual is the thing that brings the order that is good out of it. And if you're not mm -hmm. proactively doing that, it's just going mm -hmm. to be overwhelming. So mm -hmm. you can either try to protect yourself from what's overwhelming and slowly get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Intentionally go out into it and get bigger and bigger. And that, I think, is essentially what we're acting out when we do these practices. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that once we realize that's what we're acting out, that's when we're going to, um, that we'll be able to be better aligned and build better practices when we truly understand the why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Of course, like uh, this thing about uh, like uh, engaging with the challenge, this is also a huge thing for me. Like, uh, but it, yeah, as I said before, it's like um, I tried, I tried for a period not to, uh, and I realized actually, you know, like it, it was a problem. It was a problem. So, um, yeah, I would say uh, whenever there isn't uh, a challenge, there isn't a future. So it, it is um, related to this, to this concept, to this idea.
uh, for me. But yeah. So what did it mean to you to, to, to try not to do this? I mean, that was what does that mean? Yeah, like for for a certain period of time, for example, I I shifted away. I also tried not to uh, challenge myself too much. Uh, mm-hmm. For uh, like it was uh, last summer, spending like one two months away from like uh, facing my fears or you know like facing my weaknesses, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. In general, uh, not going after something that was uh, yeah really scary, etc. And, and suddenly, like, you know, everything felt very plain and, and blank. Uh, and you know like in a way it was probably similar to the uh to what you would feel uh when you die you know like there is nothing anymore there is nothing it's like you are just there with uh with yourself or you know and 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 that's that's the 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 closest we can get not having you know like some some projects and some challenges pushing us forward (laughs) this this is yeah, yeah like this super right in my my realm of things that are really interesting to me and 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 Peterson's at the heart of that cell I'm not flogging his name too hard but he talks about this idea that comes out of neurological research that um yeah that approach to cha- that when we're when we approach emotions are where we get positive emotion from so if there's something mm-hmm. that, you, that you're oriented towards and you're getting closer to it that's the major source of happiness and as soon as you mm-hmm. sort of don't have something to approach the default state is negative emotion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when we, yeah. we take our life away from moving towards things, um, all we all we're left with, in a sense, is is apathy, and and uh-huh. potentially trying to fill that hole with with hedonism, right? With drugs mm-hmm. and alcohol and sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly. Uh, <clears throat> I feel that that we should always have this sort of tension and magnetism. Uh, into what we do like uh, I always feel like I'm being pulled or I'm being pushed somewhere and uh, I, I rarely am and the people that know me knows this like uh, I'm a bit of a, of a difficult personality on, on this uh, <laughs> point of view. it's like I'm always uh, about to go somewhere or I am about you know like to do something develop something and if I stop feeling this tension uh, you know I, I slowly stop like I, yeah, you know, and, and I realize how it would be easy for many people to just uh, sit down and you know do nothing. But at the same time, uh, you know, uh, they they are not realizing what they're losing. Uh, you know, this is this. Uh, but I can connect with to what you're saying, and uh, at the same time, I can also connect to the to the whys of uh, you know. It's like it's uh, not say it's it's um, different ways to look at the at the same matter. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like there is no definite truth for for everyone. I think like it's it's just the the personal understanding and the personal um, line of thought you want to align to, like as you go. And I think it's also important to find it and then, of course, stick with it for a while until maybe you change it again and again and again. It's just uh, one thing that I'm doing with with a lot of my convictions at the moment. I need to stick with them for uh, because that it's just useful to do this. Otherwise, again, you're, I feel lost in the ocean. Um, like for example, when I when I train uh, for parkour, there is this idea of um, training for applicability. You know, yeah. uh, and it's it's a huge, huge thing. It has always uh, rang a, a bell in my head. And I have always could connect more with this this thing. It's probably maybe a romantic idea, whatever. Just uh, it allows me to to practice well. <laughs> you know, like this idea of um, being able to um, do something so that I can apply it in in any situation I need it. But actually, you know, like who are we kidding? <laughs> it's not for that. It's not only that. Uh, yeah. uh, so the, yeah. the, the day after Christmas, um, I was training at a local park and a family lost their uh a, a drone a, like a, a remote control yeah. airplane in a tree and uh-huh. i was able to climb the tree 
and get this oh, this uh, this airplane and bring it down and give it to the kid. And the woman was so thankful. She's like, you know, this was this was his biggest Christmas gift. You saved Christmas. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, you know, I was just happy that I got to use my skills in a way that was useful to somebody because it doesn't happen very often. Like if we no, it doesn't. We tell ourselves that this is what we're training for. That it's really all about saving people's lives. Um, then really everybody who does parkour should be a fireman because yeah, because we're all. Um, yeah, we're all we're all sort of masturbating. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're never <laughs> thing, right? On an, yeah, yeah, the onanistic practices. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but uh, of course I agree. At the same time, um, I also try to look at it from a slightly different perspective, in the sense that application is something that is needed and it's uh, it's useful also for uh, basic exploration. For example, you know, like once um, you have developed these new skills. Um, it's uh, since the the bone won't come to look for the dog, uh, <laughs> you know, like you are the dog and you need to look for the bones, and now you have some more tools to do it. So you go out there and suddenly you, you know, like uh, you realize you can climb certain buildings. You you realize you can use the um, the city as a as a web for your development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I, I'm actually applying everything that I've learned at least once or twice a week and all the situations where I'm into, like either uh, I am there hundred percent or I don't come home alive. Uh, so, you know, like when I, when you're, uh, when I'm doing a free solo in the mountains, uh, it's like I do it. You know, there is no option. There is no, maybe not. And this is a form of application. Of course, it's not that romantic as, you know, saving someone, but it's very, very practical. By the way, and uh, so, some of my uh, two good friends and uh, inspirations, also Blaine and Thomas, oh, yeah, yeah. they became firemen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, they, they are they are using the skills, so That's it's true. an it's a possibility. Yeah, I know about those guys. Great guys. Uh, yeah. um, Oh, I should I should uh, ask them both to come on the podcast. Actually, thanks for the reminder. But um, yeah, yeah. So um, there's this idea that comes out of. Uh, for me, I get this idea from Matt Thornton. Matt Thornton is a, um, a, a jujitsu teacher comes out of the yep. originally came from JKD. His, his school SBG is the kind of parent school from which Conor McGregor's coach comes out of as well. Um, and he, he said, basically, you know, you have martial arts that are alive and martial arts are dead. Martial arts that are alive have some sort of free f- form practice that forces you to deal with an opponent's energy timing and rhythm. Otherwise, you um, you're you're practicing in a way that doesn't have applicability, right? You're talking about yeah. applicability in reference to parkour, yeah. and and I have the same thing where it's not necessary that everyone who trains for martial arts is there to to really learn about a fight, but by by keeping it real, by by mm-hmm. by always going back to the touchstone of what the thing was about, you provide an anchor for the practice. And those martial arts that don't have an anchor around what they're practicing, to me, it's like they just float off into the ether. They become more and more divorced from reality. They have a, that's what you know. Taleb would call a skin in the game problem. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, like at, at our big uh, the Hero's Journey event that we did this year, we did a, a canyoneering trip. So this is the first time that we'd done that with people. Mm-hmm. So. You know, we play all sorts of games to try and make the practice more alive. We we chase each other. We play tag. We we do all sorts of things to say like, can you do this? Not just under ideal conditions, um, to make it more alive. But that's a particularly really cool thing because you you don't once you get on the creek, it's like you're not looking at a jump repeatedly. You're not sizing it up over and over again. You're just sort of like, it's cold. I'm wet. Um, this is cool, but I want to get the hell down this this mountain, and I don't know when it's going to be over. Right? It's like I, I've committed myself. I've been hiking for four and a half miles. I'm on this canyon, and somewhere I'm going to be able to get out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought that was, and and for all the students and for myself, that's one of the really um, unique experiences because because all of a sudden it's like you're really using those skills to navigate you through space and mm-hmm. 
you know, if you didn't have top level parkour skills, it's like, it's not that big a deal. You can still make it through the space, but it makes your life easier. It makes it more fun. And you're really able to be in the experience because you can do these mm-hmm. jumps. And then every time you're looking at a jump, it's like, it's not, it's not the jump that you're going to work on that day. It's the thing that gets you from one point to another. So you can keep getting down this Creek and that, I think it creates a very different mindset. And I think that the nature is really uniquely powerful in giving us spaces where we can tap more deeply into the aliveness of parkour. That's sort of a rant on my end, but uh, no, 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 I, I can connect. I, I just wanted to ask you uh, one question. Yeah. When it comes, for example, like uh, to, to dancing, yeah. or to other other scenarios where the paradigm changes a bit like this mm-hmm. this uh, layer of applicability uh it's um i would say uh less present yeah uh, how, how do you deal with this uh, do, do you think like these uh, practices are on a lower scale uh in a way than this or you know how i mean self expression is extraordinarily important i love to parkour dance right like one of my most frequent movement practices is to put on some music and it's just me and a tree and i'm i'm basically i start finding the rhythm and moving with the rhythm and then i start trying to incorporate movements that allow me to move over the branches and through the branch mm-hmm. in in rhythm and i actually find that it's, it's actually a very alive skill it's a really beautiful way to to actually t- tap into application of movement skill because there's a relationship in which the skill has to be expressed. So rather than Mm -hmm. choosing, this is the moment that I'm going to do the calm. This is the moment that I'm going to do the lazy lull. You're, you're expressing something to, you're trying to connect into the music and you're trying to, to build something. And it happens, it builds that, um, that, uh, improvisational skill, which is really lacking Mm -hmm. in a lot of parkour athletes. Um, so I do work with these layers of how to get people to, to connect into movement from a, an aesthetic or expressive thing. And I don't think it's less important. Um, personally, I find that the, that the, the anchor of the things that you might, that you might get hurt doing the things mm-hmm. that are, that are, you know, jumps at height chases, uh, fights to me, those feel maybe more fundamental. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the places where you have the kind of the highest skin in the game, but I think we need both. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure I can perfectly articulate how they interact with each other. That'd be, that's an interesting place for me to explore because it's not quite as simple as like, um, the, the, you know, the, the, f- the, f- the, the fighting running thing is, is, uh, is where, yeah. where all the real stuff is. Yeah. There's, there's something that's happening over in that other side. But I guess because I have come from, like I started training martial arts when I was six years old, because I've always come from that perspective of like, how would I apply this? Um, maybe I'm less mm-hmm. able to articulate what's on that other side. But I really believe that there's, there's something very powerful and, one, and, and necessary on both sides of that spectrum. I don't think people should, should, I think I see people who get like stuck completely in the, you know, if this isn't like a hundred percent pure parkour, I'm not interested. And I think that that's a really like a, that's a box. It's a prison for people's minds too. Mm-hmm. How, do you, yeah. how do you see those relationships? Yeah, no, like um, I've been ex- experiencing and experimenting a lot with uh, like aesthetics, for example. And uh, I think it's just another uh, field of interest and, and it's, it's another um, you know, bubble to dive into. Uh, I tried to move away as much as I could uh, from uh, this, just the idea of, you know, like uh, preparing in order to apply, but also, you know, like doing for doing sake or for, uh, you know, like uh, investigating something that is uh, just inside us or, you know, like just going from different paradigms because uh, whenever I talk to different people that are, you know, like deep into a certain field, they always think like, the, what they do is more important you know like you talk yeah. to the contemporary dancer and and they will tell you yeah okay but you know if i go out there and and i do a jump that scares me or i do a balance uh, on uh, at height or whatever you know they're gonna tell you okay but if i get hurt for example or you know like uh, they they can't they can't see the the, the the power in it or this idea of application they just think it's uh, it's romantic and that's it or you talk to the to the power lifters and they're gonna tell you 
you know, like just go, anything that doesn't entail like getting stronger is just bullshit, you know. So, and then you talk to the the parkour practitioner, and they will tell you that you know, uh, actually going out there and applying uh, what they do, uh, it's it's uh, it opens options, and it's it's one of the best things that you can do. Like, I am I am more towards that side, but I always try to not get stuck into it. Uh, that's also why I, you know, I'm experimenting with other things because at times I, I realize it, it might be uh, a box I'm putting myself into uh, and it shouldn't be the only thing. But the, the reason why I'm staying in there for like more than others is as you were saying, this idea of like, challenge. It, if I can find a challenge in what I do that is extremely uh, powerful and it, it involves some sort of risk and it, it, and it has this uh, reality layer that I can cut with a knife and I can eat it, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like uh, for dinner. Suddenly I come home and something changed inside of me. It's like uh, so it's right, right away. I, I can feel it, I can sense it. It's, um, it's, uh, it's just, uh, just very different. So... Awesome. I, like that, that taps into some pretty interesting things from my perspective. So I guess we're almost switching. You're the interviewer. I'm the interviewee for a second, but um, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool. Um, epistemic. So there's a, uh, I think about this question a lot, right? Everyone thinks that their, that their thing that they're passionate about is like, is the real thing is the, is the big yeah. secret. Right. So it's like, if you talk to surfers, they're like, man, what you feel on a wave, that's, that's, that's the that's nothing is ever going to come close to that and that's the real shit and like if you're not if you're not on that path then you're you're missing the best thing in life and if you talk to snowboarders and skiers and uh martial artists everybody has their narrative around why their practice is important and we're all to some degree uh we all once we have our identity tied up in our narrative uh then we're going to defend it even when it doesn't make sense to defend it so I think it's really important to recognize that. And then there's, um, and, and have, I, I think of it ep- epistemic humility, right? Epi- epistemology is the study of how we create knowledge. And so you yeah. should be, you should be some level of humility. So I have my theory about why I really do think that, that fundamentally what I consider the natural movements, which is parkour, but it's not just parkour. It's also martial arts. It's also like playing with objects. Um, there's there's play, ways that people play in every culture in the world, and to me, mm-hmm. those are fundamentally the most important movements that we should engage with. But dance is one of them, right? But it's just one; it's not the only thing. And I think yeah, when certainly. we look at these specialized practices, when we look at people who just dance, especially like ballerinas, when we look at people who just powerlift, it's very easy to see that whatever their narrative, from some perspective, it's not serving them so well, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, yeah, yeah, something is off. Yeah, I, I've worked with you know I've talked to a guy who was a former you know a world record holder in the squat, and it's like mm-hmm. he was not a, his, his optimum function when he was setting world records in the squat. Pursuing mm-hmm. being able to do heavier and heavier and heavier squats didn't make him better at everything. Um, and the same thing, right? If you're a ballerina, it's like if you reach a certain level in ballet, you've you've essentially forced your hips to be uh, to, to, uh, to have dysplasia. Like you have to have mm-hmm. dysplasia to reach a high level in, in dance. And that's not, it's not healthy. And obviously contemporary and modern dance are better than that. But I do think that, you know, like I look at yogis and I look at dancers sometimes and they're, they're, you know, I admire some things about them tremendously, but I feel like they're a bit divorced from reality because they're not getting slapped by concrete. Um, and I think mm-hmm. that, 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 that fundamentally we need to be yeah. strong. And that, that these practices do make us strong. And, and, and the strength that I see parkour athletes in particular have, to me, is more intriguing than the strength that anybody else has. Because if I take a, an elite level parkour athlete, he's going to perform fairly well on a power lift the first time you, you ask him to, you know, especially a deadlift. Mm-hmm. But, you know, no, <laughs> no yeah. power lifter is going to drop 15 feet and walk away from it. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. And, yeah, it, it might be um, again like uh, related to this this idea of being s- strong from different perspectives and different ways that also uh, allows allow us to uh, perceive reality differently. 
like uh, I, I I would say like whenever I, I take people and I make them climb their first wall and they get on top suddenly boom you know something changes inside the brain like this again it's having opened this option and having felt the the reality of their acts and the, the idea that they are uh, yeah understand there are more possibilities so i um yeah yeah i i, I agree still it's it's an ongoing question for me as well I, i've been writing a lot on the topic and i um i've been thinking we, um in which way i should change my practice in order to also find out yeah you know uh, <laughs> about this because you know not, we are talking about it but yeah like, digging into digging into it yeah yeah it's yeah. One of the things that I always come back to, honestly, is just the first stanza of the Tao Te Ching, right? Mm -hmm. The way that can be named is not the eternal way. Mm -hmm. The nameless is the mother of all things. The name gives rise to the 10,000 things. So what I draw from that is our articulations, our models will always fall short of reality. So we can, mm -hmm. we can try and refine our models. We can think about them as much as we want. We can say, this is, this is what parkour is all about. And I've, I've written a better articulation, or this is what movement practice is all about. I've written a better articulation than it's ever been written before. And it's never going to mm -hmm. capture what the thing actually is. And so you have mm -hmm. to practice the thing. You have to embody the thing. And you have to be a little bit agnostic about what you believe. And mm -hmm. I, but I think that there's a trap there because I think some people stop there. And this is what I was criticizing with, with, with Ido. It's like, it's good to mm -hmm. say, we don't know, we can't articulate what's, what's there. The nameless, right? The things that we can't articulate, that's where everything originates from. But the next line is, the name gives rise to the 10,000 things. So once we decide that things exist, that's how we create mm -hmm. all the things that are ordered. That's how we create what exists. So we have to be able to, to have both. We have to be able to see things as all one, right? Surfing, surfing is a flow sport. So snowboarding is a flow sport. Fundamentally, they're tapping to the same stuff that parkour athletes tap into. You know, when a, when a, mm -hmm. when a contemporary dancer has an amazing experience of contemporary dance, it's like the underlying neurology is the same. It's all one. Um, but also they're exactly. distinct. And there is, there is, some things are more important than others, right? Mm -hmm. Some things are higher yeah. in the hierarchy of life. And, and you, and it, it behooves the individual to, 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 to focus on the things that are most important. So mm -hmm. there's, and then within that, there's some things that are most important globally for everybody. And then there's some things that are most important for you as an individual. And that's always mm -hmm. the really tricky one to say, right? Like is parkour more important as a fundamental movement practice for me because of my temperament or is it more or important because it, it's at the fundamental aspect of how you locomotes the world? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I like to think about sure. things in this in this kind of perspective, and I, I I would say that yes, I think parkour is one of the most fundamental roles, or natural movement, the that the, those fundamental things that we see that show up in the play of every culture in the world. Um, but yeah. I also I would say that I always remember that it's a model; it's not the truth. Yeah, it's not the truth. It's it's a model, and um, I I uh, I know where, um, where you are going with this, and uh, and this is one of the reasons why now um, I think. It, you can stripe it down into, you know, like uh, finding some disciplines from to into the, um, or, or you can make some disciplines like the base of uh, your model. Um, yeah. Not all of them, like certainly some some will fit in there and some won't. By the way, you see like the things that is written everywhere here. Mm -hmm. It's the Tao Te Ching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my my brother wrote it. Okay, really study Chinese. <laughs> there you go. Mm, yeah, certainly. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm curious. You like parkour from my perspective, and you know, I've been kind of in my own little world with it. Um, but my general perspective is, uh, there was there was a method that was sort of developed by the guys who founded it. Most of that method was lost in translation as it went to the rest of the world. And then there's lots of individual people who've sort of developed some level of pedagogy, but most of the parkour community is essentially just playing. They're just doing stuff. They're just in the practice without having a real structure around it. Um, mm -hmm. And yet people have achieved incredible things. 
Um, but there are people out there who are, who are trying to think more deeply about it. And I see you as one of those people who, who, who's trying to think in a systematic way about the cultivation of the, the important aspects of parkour. And, and I'm curious kind of where you, how you're, how you're constructing your model and then also how your, your interaction with the movement culture implies it. Are you a parkour athlete who's pulling information from movement culture? Or are you a movement culture athlete who, who has a strong background in, in parkour? And, um, and what is the, the model that you're trying to bring into existence? Okay, so the model that I, I am bringing into existence at the moment, it's on, a, on an alpha stage. Uh, like, oh, sorry, on a beta stage. It means beta like stage. it's it's being de- beta stage. It, it's being yeah. developed, uh, and that's why I can tell you exactly. You know, it's it's gonna be this, 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 and that's like this is exactly the research that is it's ongoing at the moment. So um, I can tell you exactly uh, what it will entail. For sure, I have some um, uh, fields and vectors of interest that are uh, pulling me now at the moment. Like, for example, a huge thing. Um, in the in the core of parkour was uh, coming from you know like combat vital and all those uh, practices that were uh, combat, you, know, you know combat. I don't yeah, think strong. combat vital had anything to do with the origin of parkour. Uh, no, 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 not not in the, not in the sense of the of the origin of parkour, but the what it, uh, what these guys were doing in there in the same way as what parkour people were doing, yeah. uh, you know, like. It, there was something in there which was, you know, this idea of challenging yourself with whatever you could find in the in the environment, and you know, like growing from your weaknesses, and uh, you know, like so, in a. It's, yeah. I know what combat vital is, but I'm afraid the audience doesn't know. So why don't you tell yeah. us what combat vital is, and then then I'm curious what this connection that you're trying to draw between the origin of parkour and the origin of and, and the relationship of combat. Combat vital, yeah, like uh, it was a. Um, I wouldn't call it a methodology, but it was a practice uh, developed by uh, Don Jean Abré in, uh, in uh, France. I was in the, I think it was in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in, basically in this practice, the, what they were doing, they were exposing their, themselves to cold, uh, uh, like uh, diving in the, um, in the rivers at night, like walking around uh, on top of some roofs uh, without shoes and, you know, like always being barefoot, like trying to refuse routines, um, like not eating always at the same moment um, of the day, like uh, being super disciplined, uh, disciplined about what the, the, what they were doing and um, et cetera, et cetera. There is like, if you just write Combat Vital on, uh, um, on Google, I'm sure uh, like a small text from Erwan Lecor talking about it will come up. Like there is also a book, but it's in French. So uh, unless you understand French, it would be impossible to, to get into it. But of course, so it was all based around this idea. Oh, and, and they were also doing certain interesting things, like for example, uh, being immobile for a long, long period of time, uh, for uh, long hours at night, just staying there, breathing, uh, understanding, feeling, rather than talking uh, you know they, they were doing these kind of things and uh, they were exploring the surroundings in any form and in a way uh, also in the beginning of parkour there was this thing you know like there was this feeling and actually it was also uh, geographically i think uh, pretty close yeah and, they're both in paris in their origins yeah right? like ar- yeah yeah mm, around like close by but yeah um, and um, yeah, in, in parkour as well, uh, they had this uh, idea, you know, like, how can I, uh, can I do this? Can I do that? You know, like, just can I lift that rock? Can I jump on top of that mm-hmm. building? Can I go around the, the bridge, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, they both had this kind of questions. So I realized this uh, kind of principle of challenge, it's one of the, of the fundamental layers. And um, so certainly this deep deserves a place uh, into the system, into the method, uh, like this principle of challenge. So certainly uh, it should be in there. Um, then, of course, like uh, exploring out there uh, was also another thing that was in common. <clears throat> so uh, what kind of forms of you know exploration are out there? Uh, it can be, you know, like uh, going on top of uh, some buildings you're not, not allowed to go or going down into the sewers uh, trying to figure out what's down there, etc. So <clears throat> there is also 
and this layer of exploration and then challenge and then um of course you have um the the layer of pre physical preparedness uh, and um, physical preparedness technical preparedness mental preparedness in general everything that entails uh, you preparing for for what is about to come uh, then okay so this this um are all part of of my methodology that i'm developing but uh, yeah i'm trying to to learn from history and from um like the present the present what are other people developing and then i try to add something of my own uh, then of course like another thing that was related to challenges is the, the fear work uh, that I always address via height exposure because it's one of the easiest things that I can do. Um, certainly, then I, we have the, um, the the applicability layer where you have all the all sort of vaulting and uh, uh, you know like climbing and all uh, brachiating and all sort of like locomoting uh, practicing. In there, you you have um, a, an aesthetics layer um, you, because it's it's uh, I mean it's it's present present and there is a lot of efficiency also in aesthetics. Uh, this is one thing I was talking a lot about with uh, with Gato as well. Uh, yeah, you know, like this this idea that if you're able to use your delicatess and you know you are gentle when you do things and suddenly uh, you're able to be more efficient suddenly you, you're able to produce growth inside you uh, so um, I, I'm developing a system for a, a flow with bars but also walls and you know other objects that you can find out there etc uh, etc et it's a, I'm trying to give you a bit of a, mm -hmm. of a broad map sure. but you know yeah. it's, it's, it's well, hard for me to yeah, yeah, let's let's dig into a few of those because I think it'd be interesting. It's just to kind of like I'm I'm curious if you're willing to share some of your ideas around that. So, a mm -hmm. um, couple three that are interesting to me is fear work, how we deal with the mental game, um, uh, the the balance between physical conditioning and technical. This is one of my big areas of interest. Is when you have a really broad physical practice, the technical work has a lot of of physical impact, and how do mm -hmm. you balance or find a way to to make sure you're meeting the needs of the technical development and the physical development so they support each other and then the last one is is flow that's a particular interest of mine right now as i'm trying to conceive i've, I've been trying to break down a schema of of essentially what are the components of movement flow not psychological flow but movement flow and then once you understand the component pieces how do you create ways to specifically challenge them to optimally cultivate the athlete. So I'm curious what goes into your, let's start with, uh, I think that if we go through those three, that's probably enough for the interview for today. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So let's get through those three. So let's start with fear. What, what is going mm -hmm. into your fear practice right now? How do you, how do you conceptualize yeah. that? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. So uh, you mean from a practical perspective, right? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. From, from a practical perspective, practical perspective the first rule is exposure so i think uh, in the same way as a rugby player gets tackled i don't know a few, or, or, or tackles someone for a like very few tackles per, per game a parkour practitioner often um, goes up at height and spends there very little time and this is one of the first problems that i see uh, if you want to get better at something you need to expose yourself into it which means you need to create certain drills or you need to create certain uh, uh, tasks or whatever you can you can come up with and create uh, that will allow yourself to spend more time up there, which uh, of course like uh, need to um, uh, progress in complexity and difficulty and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, and and should be a bit a bit out of your comfort zone, but should allow you to stay um, there for a long period of time. So that means, for example, if I am going out to do some form of height exposure training at the moment i won't spend uh, you know 10 minutes at height and two hours down you know like waiting for the task to uh, to occur you know like I, I would spend most of the time up there and this is the first thing call me, call me an idiot but this is you know like this is the base of the practice and this is the thing that everybody needs to understand 
uh, first thing. So, you know, just um, figuring out that would mean like creating uh, some uh, some tasks, for example, uh, you know, like um, passing balls, but it can be, you know, like playing with partners, uh, um, doing some form of, again, immobilism up there, up there uh, creating some uh, smaller tasks, like, for example, uh, going from one place to another, going up into some, uh, up into touching something and coming back down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or playing with the, with the partner, one person is up there and one person is, is below. And, you know, like f finding a way to uh, make the, um, the being up there in the height something normal in a way. And, uh, you know, like I always create some scales for what I do. So I start, that's how you also in, uh, in behavioral uh, psychology, if I'm not wrong, that's the way they do it. They would write, okay, I have a fear of spiders, for example. I write one looking yeah. at the spider from you know from a from a mirror and then into a tv and then 10 you know it's like touching the spider or take, taking it into into your hand so i i do create all these different scales and i do make sure i can quantify a bit what i'm doing uh, and you know and then uh, as i build up suddenly of course like the body adapts because it adapts mm -hmm. to anything and I'm finding myself less scared of, of being at high, but also uh, with a lot more awareness of what's happening. And um, basically fear becomes uh, something that is, that is close, close by, you know, like stays on top of me. It's like, remember that if you fall, you, you, <laughs> you're dead. You know, it stays there. I, I'm not saying like, go away. This is, this is crazy. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Hope can cool, a couple ideas there that I really liked. One is that you mentioned uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I, I've come to think of movement practice as a sort of motoric behavioral therapy. Okay. Right? Essentially, it's about exposure to the things yep. that 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 limit you, that you might become less limited, that you might become stronger. And I think that embodying that physical practice is is one of the most profound ways to start living that meaningful life. So that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting that you're, you're kind of looking in the same realm and, and, and bringing mm -hmm. that. And then also I thought, you know, talking about exposure is interesting. I remember hearing stories about the Yamakaze, like Jan going up on top mm -hmm. of buildings and playing music or just like playing video games, sandwiches, just to do exactly that. Um, yeah. But one, one question I have about that is, is actually overexposure, right? Like you talked about feeling the fear. Um, mm -hmm. and what I've noticed is that if I spend too much time at height, and I think there's a few other folks who've had this in the parkour community, you actually become apathetic to it. You become, mm -hmm. uh, you become too inured to fear. There's a, when you look at, uh, motorcycle motor, uh, well, it works with soldiers as well. Time in the field and, um, and, uh, blah, 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 blah. helicopter time yeah. missions, right? There's uh -huh. a uh -huh. shaped mortality curve. It's like when you're overreactive, you die a lot. When you're yep. optimally reactive, you stop dying. If you stay yeah. under the exposure too long, you become apathetic mm -hmm. to the danger and you start dying. This happens all the time with like um, units of soldiers. When they go into the field, they're hyper reactive. They get killed all the time. They become, mm -hmm. they become optimally reactive and they perform really well. But if you leave them under pressure for too long, all of a sudden they just stop caring. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you ever run into that in your practice and how you would negotiate the, the avoidance of apathy when it comes to uh, fear of death with, with very dangerous things that we do. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I think you can only uh, get used to fear uh, if you're doing something that is extremely easy for you. Um, because like it never, literally never happened that to me that if, if, I, um, if I'm doing tasks that are right out of the comfort zone. And every time I try to challenge myself to find something that is harder and harder, um, then it stays, it stays. It's very rare for it to leave entirely and completely. And if it does, uh, I would say uh, you, you, you are in a good place, which is not the place of, you know, like being completely, uh, you know, neutral to fear. You're in a place where you're very attentive and you you are at, at your full you, you are there to with your full potential then of course like uh, i remember seeing the the mri on uh, uh, alex arnold 
mm-hmm. brain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it was showing that he, he, mm, he just wasn't reacting like a normal person to, to height. Mm-hmm. It was just no, uh, you know, like he had no recognition for it in a way in the, in the brains. But this is, of course, an adaptive response. And I think this is something we, we want, actually, because if you are up there, but of course you, you are able to disconnect from those layers where, you know, like you have... Uh, friends or whoever shouting at you yeah do that do that it's like mm-hmm. it's always on you like if you're able to to, to maintain uh, maintain a somewhat of a conscious mind and you know like a focus then i would say if the fear diminishes it's just there to help but of course it's it's a problem because in the development in the development uh, if you are if if the kids uh, are too young for example they would be they wouldn't feel that much fear uh, and they might get hurt. But if you go through a process and you, every time you maintain the discipline, every time you maintain the focus, every time you understand what you're doing and you take it as seriously as your life, uh, you're not risking more. That's, that's, what I, that's what I have experienced. That's what, what people told me uh, they had experienced as well. So, um, but, I, but I realized it could be a, a problem in some cases that means um, whenever we are going into these kind of practices we should place our mindfulness as a guardian there you, you know like if fear cannot be here you know there must be mindfulness you know, uh, because that's what it is actually it's it's uh, it's something that is telling us okay be careful be careful because if you fall <laughs> You're not gonna live to see another day, and if if you replace it with something a bit more rational, sometimes it can be useful because like having sweat hands or having the heart beat raised like crazy up there, it's a problem. Yeah, uh, it's costly. The way I think of it is fear. I think of fear as something to ride and something to avoid being ridden by, but I think that you need it. You need a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a friend. Um, and if you don't have it, it's dangerous. So I've had pl- times in my practice where I've become a truly apathetic to fear, where I just don't feel the fact that I'm at the point that I, I could die if I failed what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And I've always mm-hmm. taken that as a signal that it was time to walk away, that it was time to go home, um, mm-hmm. that, that, that I was no longer operating with the type of attention that was necessary. Um, so, so that's just something that I would, I would, I would, yeah, I think it's an interesting thing to pay attention sure. to. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, I mean, like, it also happened to me, but then I, I also moved away from it a bit because I realized, okay, if it's a lack of, of attention, for example, of the moment um, that is hitting me, uh, I should stop anyway because it doesn't allow me to practice deliberately. Yeah. Uh, so then that's the reason why I would go home. Uh, but as long as I can stay uh, aligned, uh, I don't see it as a, as a huge problem if it leaves your body. But um, yeah, I, re- I realize, again, it's a, it's a really hard topic. That's why it's so interesting. And uh, it's not forgiving. So uh, that's why it requires a lot more uh, understanding and digging into it. Yeah. So, so you, you have exposure. What else? And you, you have kind of a, you, you qualitatively um, measure, measure, you have a qualitative measurement of your, of your exposure, and then you try to build it up systematically over time. What else do you exactly. to kind of building your mental game for fear? Yeah. So um, there is, there is a lot of awareness, attention that comes um, from, um, you know, understanding what you can, can do. Uh, and this is an, an evaluation that you need to do every time in any in any form. Uh, then I have a lot of uh, different forms of visualizations, uh, some form of readings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some some proprioceptive um, exercises to just understand, for example, where your uh, proximity ball is, and uh, you know, like how how much I can. Uh, um, I can uh, lose my balance before it's over. You know, for example, this is one thing I play with a lot. Like understanding all the different limits, like from also from a very physical perspective. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, like um, 
if I grab this, will I be able to hold another uh, really nice uh, game that I, that I play? It's like, okay, now you are going to hang and you're going to tell me uh, how many seconds you still have before you let go, you know? And, you know, like certain people after a while, they realize they, they can remodel the tension that they have in their hands to hold way longer than they thought. For example, it's just, just one of the many tools that, are, that I'm using and developing. But, uh, you know, like, for example, remodeling tension or uh, working with balance for perception, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's just a lot of different uh, tools coming from uh, different fields. And at once, once are, uh, that are mixed, uh, can give you suddenly a, a model to work with. Um, for perception, balance, some, some other attributes. And then, of course, exposure. And uh, yeah, this, this, uh, this is the model that I'm developing right now. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. So uh, I, I would prefer, no, but also with the rest, not to not go in a, an extremely systematic way because it might not be right. <laughs> yeah. And this is. Well, this is the thing. I think if you take it, the if you go with humility, it's worth trying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be careful. Yeah, no, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> hello, cat. <Yeah>, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So I, I hear kind of two main elements. One is uh, the exposure, and the other is sort of learning to map all the variables that might be important when you're under the stress and how to. Yeah how to shift those specifically in relationship to fear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how to exactly. body tension. That's obviously huge. When we're, when we're stressed and fearful, it's easy to end up holding too tight. So yeah. how, do you, how do you let go of that in, in a place in which you are, are fearful? Uh, is there any other components to, to your, your mental game method or is that kind of the big two areas of your research? No, that, that's the, that's the biggest uh, areas of research. Also, uh, like recently, I'm, uh, I've been going into breathing uh, yeah. in different forms. Of course, like tension can can end up in different places, and this. But these fields, uh, of course, let's not be mistaken. They are huge. They are huge, <laughs> like in ways in which you can expose yourself to um, to 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 heights are infinite. Also, the typology of drills and techniques and mm -hmm. you know principles you can come up with are. Uh, they are infinite. That's yeah. So those are those are the mains at the moment. Okay, excellent. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, some good some good stuff. I think for the for the audience and myself to kind of take away and play with. So yeah. then the next uh, the next one I, I'm interested in is your kind of take on on the role of conditioning or or physical development in the overall movement practice. So you're uh, you're student a student of Edo's. You're also doing strength conditioning as a master's. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're you're still primarily kind of oriented towards a parkour-based practice. Is that correct? So, um, after a lot of studies and blah blah blah, I realized this strength is specific, and there is no way around it. So, uh, the physical the, the physical preparedness should be something that um, bounds your your uh, uh, your uh, your joints, and it allows you to be um, uh, better and less uh, and a bit more resilient to uh, whatever you know impact or whatever you can take. Uh, this is um, this is a uh, this is a super important base to start from. Which means, for example, if you are spending more time in the gym than training outside, or like you know, like lifting weights rather than training outside, it, you, you're not going to get huge benefits because everything that you can get is some transfer but there is nothing as good as the thing itself to make you better at that thing, which means like, for example, if you, if you want to train your jumping power or you know, like there is nothing better than jumping uh, to develop it. And this is uh, like, for me, it's, it was a big realization because I've always looked for something, you know, like, okay, I, I do some powerlifting movements or some weightlifting movements in, or, in order to make my jump higher and, and, and better, et cetera, et cetera. Then I realized, a lot of people are actually just jumping a lot, you know, like and uh, with the with the in the right way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they are developing uh, in an incredible way. Having said so, uh, the the 
uh, theory, like uh, the, all the methodologies are not wrong. Like if, if um, you know, like clean and jerks and this and that were, were not useful in, uh, like, for example, in uh, Olympic uh, sports, they wouldn't use them. Uh, you know, so they are useful, but the, the point is they should be something uh, corollary to your practice. So I just wanted to put this out there in mm -hmm. the sense that if, yeah, you know, like if you're training, um, let's say you're practicing five, six times, times per week, it's okay if you, if you are spending two of those trainings, uh, training a bit more uh, general, generally, like uh, for example, uh, performing some form of big lift or you know, like like doing some uh, some kind of strength training. And um, the way I am addressing it at the moment is um, at first building a, a base for um, general capacity and technique, um, which means uh, together with all the all the uh, practices that are more technical, uh, technically technical based, I would uh, give one two days. Uh, usually two days of strength training, but that first period would be uh, extremely useful in order to build, uh, to understand how to pull, how to push, how you know, like um, how to overload our bodies in the right way, uh, which is uh, often it often comes from understanding how uh, how you should apply pressure in the right way to the. To the different objects that you're using to, to develop yourself or uh, or, or on, onto yourself if you're, if you are for example pulling up on, onto some okay so this is the first phase on the second phase I would um, work hard on potentiating the nervous system uh, and like while maintaining that technique and then I would suddenly go into some form of a, of a progressive overload routine stays more or less the same in similar motions uh, so that you can actually get strong. Nothing extremely complex, but something that you can um, keep up for a long, long period of time, making sure that like, the, the, the loads are increasing. This is uh, the basic, uh, the basic um, approach that I have. Um, so keeping the two quite separate um, and giving the most important to the to the actual technical preparedness, and um, by like, if you, if you wanted to know something in regard to to exercise selection, for example, um, I would pick the best um, tools out there and the simpler tool out, tools out there to develop yourself. So, um, I would say like using a barbell to do a bit of squats and a bit of deadlifts, and if you if you are able to Doing a bit of weightlifting as well as uh, that's great. Mm, mm, clean then, and jerks and snatches by weightlifting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, like everything should be contextualized and it should have a logic behind it. Like people shouldn't just okay today I'm just going to to jerk and you know or today I'm just going to go for five five <laughs> five by five score yeah, yeah. and uh, like it's uh, it's not the the way it should it should go. There should be a logic behind it, and then from a, like a, a pushing perspective, for example, mm, I would pick uh, the, the the best tools that are out there. For example, um, bench pressing could be great if you are uh, integrating it with um, uh, the specific motions that are useful in what you do. Like, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> wait a second, muscle ups or climb ups. Or you know, as in the case of applicability and parkour, and you know all this all this area, uh, pull ups, weighted weighted pull ups, uh, chin ups on the rings, um, rope climbs, you know, like uh, all these kind of um, all these kind of tools that are extremely um, simple and the same way they're very uh, easy to progressively overload with time and that can give you a lot. Um, um, yeah, so what else? Of course, like you can substitute the, uh, for example, the bench press or the, the chin ups with other exercises. The important thing is uh, you should be able to contextualize them and to understand them and, you know, like, and, and place them into the, 
um, in the right relationship with the rest of the of the exercises that you're doing. Like the point is, a lot of people that I see are developing their strength as if they, the, it was like their main thing that they're they're doing, and this is absolutely crazy. You know, like uh, what? Why would you do it if if only the only thing you do is power lift, for example? And then you train parkour once per week. You're 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 a power lifter, you know. Like, yeah. And, and nothing wrong with that, but do acknowledge that it's like it's this, you know. It's uh, in terms of practice. In terms of um, at the same time, uh, when when it comes down to technical preparedness, for example, uh, I also use um, <clears throat> a lot of repetitions uh, in order to make the skill get well ingrained into the into the body of the person. Uh, and that is, of course, physical preparedness. But at the same time, I, I just don't put it on, under the same cap because it's a bit easier to, uh, to, to create a model on, on, top, of, on top of it. Like, but again, it should be progressive. It should be uh, sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it should be like when you're practicing deliberately, in my view, you should be leaving the practice for most times uh, fresh. You know, like fresh and, and ready to go for more. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. It, it shouldn't drain you. It shouldn't leave you absolutely dead. Uh, that's not how you, you, you keep it sustainable if you're practicing every day, obviously. So I know it, it's, it's a bit uh, all over the place. But the point is, I really um, try to um, individualize to the typology of needs of the, of the person. And the, this needs analysis should be done with everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll come up with, the, with some um, methodologies and ideas for like a, a broader uh, public. But then uh, once I do, uh, it will be a, a process that is, I don't know, it can be like four to five years to complete as, a, as an idea of uh, like a physical preparedness program because those are the logics that are installed in our bodies. You can do anything in six weeks. You can do anything in three months. <laughs> this is my view at least. Like otherwise you have this, this, uh, this peak and then yeah, I mean, go down. You can make a, a physiological change in an athlete. That's yeah, of course. Of course. 12 weeks. Um, how persistent it is, is, is you know, you, you have to keep doing it. Um, Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit vague. It's hard to it's hard to glean it out there. I mean, it sounds like we're on the same page on a lot of these things. One is, um, you know, obviously the most the most relevant adaptions are going to be the adaptions that are produced by the activity that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But um, we we can use ancillary training to support that. We have to remember that it's ancillary training. That's where I think a lot of people go wrong is that they don't remember that it's ancillary training. Um, and then there's the question of how do you actually make sure that it's relevant to the goals of the athlete and to the needs of the athlete. And that's where the that's where it gets complicated, right? You know, everyone says squat, deadlift, but for instance, I um, I don't deadlift because I, I I worked with a group called Sparta Performance Science, and Sparta um, they do a force split analysis and they base all of their prescriptions off of force split analysis. Mm -hmm. And so essentially they, they've discovered that there are kind of three primary force variables that are revealed by the force plate. One is the speed at which an athlete produces force, especially in the eccentric phase. They call that your load variable. The second mm -hmm. is the stability of force production. So how much force do you leak during um, the switch between eccentric to concentric? Mm -hmm. um, and the rate of force development. Um, so that was the first one. So then the second one, ah, is the, the first one is the, okay. 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 Yeah. Stability. And then the last one is actually how long you're able to, to prolong force production. Um, so the impulse of your, of your, of your, yeah. um, your movement against the force plate. And so essentially you can think of that as rate. Of, it's kind of like rate of force development, stabilization and mobility to some degree or hip drive. Um, those are the kind of three variables that they look at. What they find is that athletes who are, excessively strong in one of these areas relative to other areas um, become prone to specific patterns of injury. So yeah. I was especially strong in my explodability. I was very able to stabilize forces, um, but I had relatively weak ability to prolong force. And that's mm -hmm. typically associated with people who have, say, uh, 
hamstring injuries, Achilles tendon injuries, lower limb injuries, ankle sprains. Mm -hmm. You're, yep. you're better at creating force than uh, than decelerating force. So um, mm -hmm. they they find that the deadlift is the most powerful way of driving that ability to increase stability. So for an athlete like me, a deadlift actually makes me more fragile by making me stronger at the thing I'm already strong at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, so, no, of course it makes sense. Like the, the only thing that I wanted to add into this is like uh, in order to measure your rate of force development or stability in this, like you need the uh, to have access to some force plates, etc. Yeah. Like this is something that, like well, not not, yeah. not everyone else. Like you, you can try to measure, for example, the differences between the counter movement jump and the mm -hmm. uh, non counter movement jump, and then you see if the gap, you know, like you can uh, get a little bit of a, a guide like by looking like. If you if you uh, if you watch a video of someone, you can look and you watch in slow motion. You can see at the bottom of their uh, their counter movement is their back rounding. Are their knees caving in? And that's a signal of how much uh, how much mm -hmm. destabilization they're experiencing. And then when you uh, and then for their their kind of impulse under load, you can look at how far their hip goes down and then how high far their hip extends before they leave the ground. Um, and then. Mm -hmm speed thing is harder you know you can you you can probably get uh, uh, a little bit of a guide of that you know using just visually or or using some kind of tool to say you know how fast is that counter movement so it's possible it's just not as accurate so that's yeah how, yeah, yeah but um but anyways I, I just wanted to bring that I just was sort of interested to throw that in there as an example of how we how we can kind of start tuning into the individual needs of athletes and that Yes, as a general rule, you know, if you want to increase leg strength, the bilateral uh, barbell lifts are a fairly effective tool. Um, they're especially great for beginners. But then there's the, the spe yeah. specificity of what's this athlete working with. And then the, as the athlete cult is developed, then we need to be more and more kind of uh, attentive to their individual needs. Yeah, no, for sure. Like all the all the different parameters should be brought up together. Uh, like plyometric strength should be uh, should be there and should be assessed in the same way as it should be. Like uh, uh, th their capacity to to, uh, to to produce maximal force, uh, as you were saying, like um, calculating their impulses and blah blah blah. And you know, like there are a lot of things that we we, we can juggle and put, them, put put together in order to define the. Uh, exercise selection. I was just talking a bit from the um, from a generalist from a general per perspective. Like yeah. when I think about training, like strength training and physical preparedness, I always try to address it from uh, the, the, in, in the simplest of the ways, uh, and then I I leave uh, a lot of the of the technic technicalities um, uh, to, to all the specific work in. Uh, in the mm. in the rest of the of the skills skills training, but but of course yeah I I understand I, like I I agree that um, if there is no individualization uh, you're gonna have some problems at a certain certain point, or especially if you come from a very uh, particular background or you have some problems yourself and that, that needs to be solved you know like this like for example uh, you say uh, you have uh, uh, in like the right Achilles that has some problems, you know, like should at first go for an assessment and understand what is the, the reason for it to be there. Uh, meanwhile, I would still work on progressive overload and you know, like basic exercises and then um, address it specifically. But this is, uh, it's, it's a very complex matter and, and it's hard for me to say, okay, this is the methodology that I'm using for everyone in, uh, from, from a broad, sure. broad, from the broadest perspective, you, you, know, like, you want to be able to get kind of like articulate specifically um, the things that can be specific while leaving the things yeah. that can be specific and specific. Exactly. But but yeah, if I can with the, with the athletes again, I'm just going to work on uh, at first the bilateral motions, and I, I would. Uh, um, uh, try to to make sure they're following a, a simple progressive overload protocol uh, on on some of these, yeah. um, and then contextualize into what they're doing and you know adding and adding some other exercises. I'm I'm uh, absolutely against super ritualistic practices anyway. Uh, if if against somebody super no I, I, 
ritualistic practices. Ritualistic. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, like Good if stuff. you tell if you're telling me like like again, like the deadlift should be in everyone's program. Okay, yeah. yeah. Of course not. Of course not. But there is a difference if you if you tell me, okay, uh I don't know that person and uh I don't have a lot of ways to test that person and blah blah. Uh, I look at um, a deadlift and I look at I don't know a bent leg uh, or a single leg deadlift or you know, I would choose the, the deadlift anyway. I, yeah. Like if I if I have to just pick one. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like people that can can't do twenty pull ups, I wouldn't uh, make them work towards like a one arm chin up or things like this. You know, like there is no reason for it to to be. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I just were we've been chatting for quite a long time. It's great. Uh, but I did want to get into the flow oh, yeah. question just a little bit before we, we finish up here. So well, I'm sure we'll have other chances to, to, to talk yeah, for sure. about some, uh, <laughs> of, of strength and conditioning. So tell me a little bit about how you're trying to conceptualize flow and build methods to, to kind of help athletes um, more effectively tap into it and get better movement flow. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, uh, when talking about flow, I try, of course, I, I make people work um, on two techniques because that, that is necessary. But uh, I try to make them explore uh, different attributes. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an essential thing uh, that people need to understand. Like, uh, for example, interconnection of different motions or, um, you know, silence or uh, the, the, the ability to control uh, what they are doing or the, the ability, uh, which means, for example, like uh, reversing emotion that they've just done Reversal. rather than, you know, like, yeah, reversibility, like, uh, you know, like working on all these different attributes uh, to ensure or even uh, like coordination, like basic coordination or basic rhythm. Um, this is essential. If, if you don't have these uh, elements in, into you, uh, you won't be able to produce uh, flow in, in general. You, you won't be able to uh, create a motion that doesn't look robotic and if you're able to create a motion that is not robotic and it's aesthetically pleasing it means it's filtered in and somehow your body has digested it well um, and and i can see this with like for example if you take um, a contemporary dancer or you take i don't know like some gymnasts at time even if it's it's hard uh, you know and you tell them okay do this do that they'll be able to do it and sometimes it, it drives me crazy because like they, they just connect it uh, right away. So um, once I, uh, like, so first of all, I would work uh, separately on all these different attributes. Uh, and then I would um, try to build different sequences um, that, that would be the, the um, uh, field work, you know, like, because at the end of the day, we can't just talk about attributes. You need to do it. So you uh, need to create different scenarios for, uh, for um, uh, where you, you can uh, uh, dance with the partner, dance with yourself, create a choreography, create a, um, create a sequence, work on a single technique, work on, uh, you know, like uh, finding, again, a, a small task for you to go into, but while maintaining the focus on the, on the attributes behind it, in a way, yeah. rather than rather than the, the movement itself. Um, and another thing that I make people do, they, I, I use the, like, I always make sure somebody's looking at them or somebody's looking at me. I always make sure I, I film what I do or I make them film what they do. Because in this case, it's like, um, suddenly um, you, you, you are in your own mind and you're not, you're not realizing what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the in the world, so you need this internal strive and at the same time an external, um, yeah, an external uh, input for you to go back into and, and uh, your, yeah, I yeah, think. because. I just think it's funny when you record video because you felt like it was good and then you watch it on video and you're like, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible. Yeah, it happened immediately. And, and then you, and then you, then you have to go back and make it good. So, um, so it's a great, I, it's a great tool. I like, um, uh, I think when you can get clearer feedback, uh, clearer, more relevant, more immediate feedback, you can always improve a process faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, this, this is uh, from, from again a broad perspective, but uh, the idea is anyway uh, to break it down into I don't know, like what attributes am I going to work with and then uh, in which families of technique and then in which techniques. And then while I'm working on the techniques, you know, like I, I, I would just uh, go back and make sure I am addressing the right things for the, the people that are in there. You know, like if, uh, if people are doing uh, a certain technique without grace, for example, or without, uh, like, not being able to keep, the, I don't know, the center of mass close to the, to the object and, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, they are not able to, um, yeah, be, be silent or whatever. Suddenly, they are not working on what they should be working. So, uh, it's, always, it's, again, a matter of focus. It's a matter of focus and awareness of, about what, what we are doing, um, in which way, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, this is uh, this is the way that I'm that I'm uh, developing. These are the ways that I'm developing at the moment. Yeah, mm. I, uh, I'm doing something similar in a way where I've I've broken flow down into essentially control of rhythm, control of displacement of the object, control of the direction of your inertia, uh, control of your orientation, your ability to orient your 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 appropriate uh, your perceptual systems effectively so that you can continue moving through the, uh, the object and the ability to control the structure of your body so that you're in a position to produce power effectively. Um, mm -hmm. and risk management, making sure that you're making the right choices. So of six categories and then essentially what you're doing is trying to, um, find ways to say, okay, go through this course, see if you can notice the ways in which this area, this attribute can be improved. Um, and then, and then we have ways of challenging those attributes, like ways of challenging rhythm or yep. ways of challenging displacement. So there's specific drills or specific skills that you know are going to make the athletes struggle more. And simply by putting mm -hmm. them in that situation where they struggle to attain it, knowing that it's the thing they're trying to attain, they're going to become more powerful at it. So, mm -hmm. so it's interesting. I noticed you talked about displacement. You said keeping the center of mass close to the, the thing you talked about rhythm. So it sounds like there's a lot yeah. of um, some common ideas within that. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, like what you're saying is just uh, articulating them in a, in a more me methodological and uh, systematic <laughs> way, but it's, yeah. it's extremely similar to what I'm, it's uh, like as long as uh, there is a bit of clarity in understanding, you know, like yeah. what is going on and what, how it can be broken down. I think, uh, we are on a, on a very similar page there. Of course, like then it wouldn't surprise me if, if, if even some uh, techniques or uh, some exercises were similar. Absolutely. Uh, even if, we, because like the, the, the principle behind this are, are, are the same. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've been talking for like two hours now. So uh, <laughs> I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for the conversation. For anyone who's interested in, in knowing more about your work or how to contact you, is there anything you'd uh, like to share with people? Yeah, like um, now, now I'm uh, I'm planning different workshops, and uh, they they can be updated like looking at, in, into my uh, social media. Uh, my Instagram is uh, palazzo dot marcello, but I'm sure they'll be able to, uh, to to see it once this gets published. Um, and yeah, on Instagram and Facebook, I'm posting everything and. Uh, I'll be doing a big event in uh, July, probably this year, okay. uh, where I'll be yeah, developing a bit of my uh, ideas. And every year, I'm uh, I'm trying to add <clears throat> a bit more, and I'm I'm, pre I'm presenting on my most recent researches. Um, and in my website, just uh, www.marcellopalotto.com. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's it. Then, of course, like if uh, some of the people that are listening are from Italy, <clears throat> then you guys. You can come to, to our parkour classes in uh, on parkour way, and yeah, that, that's it basically. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rafe. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye, bye, Rafe. Thank you for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave a review on iTunes if you can. Finally. As we mentioned before the show, this is a listener-supported podcast, and if you want to have the most regular content, have the best guests on, and give you guys the best quality of audio and video, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and I look forward to sharing more with you guys soon.